Salutations, one and all! This is my, uh, six things I hate about Revolume 7 video. And right off the bat, let me just say, I do not hate this volume by any stretch of the imagination. I love this volume. Uh, probably the second best volume, at least in my opinion. Nothing's topping Volume 3 unless they do something really spectacular. But there were just a few things I did not like. Things that irked me, things that annoyed me, that I just feel like talking about. And no one can stop me! So let's get into this. Uh, they're not really in any particular order, just how I feel like talking about them. All right, first off, let's talk about Mero. Now, I like Mero. I loved his semblance. I thought it was really cool. I thought he had some really great moments back and forth in the characters. He doesn't seem as blindly obedient to Iron was the rest of them. And he's the only one in the Aesops who isn't actively attempting to murder Team Ruby. So, you know, he gets a lot of points for that. My problem with him is he's a Faunus. The only Faunus on the Aesops the most elite team in the most racist city in the world, and he is basically a joke. And I don't know why. I mean, he's clearly trying to act cooler than he is when he's really just a big old goofball, and he feels like a caricature of what people think of Faunus is, you know? Goofy, dumb, unable to control his emotions. And, and nobody respects him. The Aesops are constantly making fun of him. Ironwood tells Clover not to take him on a mission because he's not subtle enough. Even Ruby doesn't seem to respect him, so... I just don't know. I don't really get what's going on here. Why they had to make the one Faunus in all the Aesops such a joke character. I mean, if the racism had been a plot point this volume, if they'd been like, oh yeah, the Aesops are a little racist, that's not good. I could understand that thing that would have made a lot of sense, but we got no hint of that. But Mero is so goofy and clumsy and just slow that he actually seems to deserve all the jokes and prods are put his way, and at the same time, he is not a dumb character. He has a moment with Blake. This society is set up for Faunus to be at the bottom, and humans are willing participants. They benefit from doing nothing to help us, but there are still those who actively abuse us. Which probably remains one of the smartest things ever said in all of Ruby. So, and this is at least part of the reason why I was 100% convinced that he was going to be the traitor, the spy. He was going to pull his hair back. Laugh maniacally, freeze Team Ruby and the Aesops, grab the relic, and do a whole evil villain monologue about why he's working for Salem to take out humanity so that the Faunus can reign supreme. So think Adam, but more subtle and a better actor. And yet we never got that, so... I, I don't know, I just don't get why Kruby decided to make the one Faunus on the team just such a joke. It would be different if, you know, Harriet was a rabbit Faunus or Elm was... A bear faunus or vine with a snake faunus. I mean, if any of that was the case, I'd be like, I mean, yeah, we have one goofball, uh, slow faunus, but we also have this one really cool, really badass faunus. So there's no problem there. It's not, it's not like they're saying, this is the epitome of what the faunus should be. I don't know, that just felt really weird and it kind of bothered me, but let's move on. <laughs> Next up, Renora. So, Ren and Nora have had. Like, zero significance to the plot since Volume 4. That was the last time we really saw them do anything of significance. Heck, they missed out on, like, half the last volume because the Team Juniper ended up separating from Team Ruby, which was a great decision. It gave us more time to focus on Team Ruby. But at the same time, you know, we just haven't had any really good Ren and Nora plot significance or character growth of any kind whatsoever. And in this one, they wanted to give us a whole bunch. So we had Ren going from ignoring Nora completely to arguing with her, to making out with her right before a bunch of people are killed, to siding with Ironwood against her, to crying about being unable to hit Neo when she was disguised as Nora, to actively screaming at her. Then why aren't we holding the relic? Now Salem has the lamp, Ironwood has the staff, and we have nothing! Ren! Why? I mean, the best explanation I've heard on this so far is... That he's feeling conflicted between his duties as a huntsman and his desire to be with her. And, and that's causing a lot of conflict in him. But there had to be better ways of doing that than just making him seem like an absolute jerk. And seriously, that kiss was... That kiss just felt so misplaced. Like, I kind of get you could argue, oh, that just furthers it because he was busy kissing her instead of uh, keeping an eye out for Tyrion. There's nothing he could have done, even if he wasn't actively kissing her at that moment, but... But it feels like both ship baiting and ship hating at the same time. Like, they just actively turned Ren into an unpleasant person, a character I truly do not like as he is right now. I mean, I do have hopes that they're gonna find a way to 
fix this, put this all together, make it mean something next volume. But as things stand right now, Ren was just basically a bully to Nora this entire volume, despite how much she truly cares about him, and I just did not like that. Alright, next up, let's talk about Tyrion's escape, because there was so much wrong with this. Literally, everything was wrong with this. I went over this quite a bit in my review, but let's just sum things up. Ironwood sent out an arrest warrant for both Crow and his nieces while Crow was in the middle of transporting a dangerous criminal. Clover decides that it's best to arrest Crow while they're transporting a dangerous criminal. Robin decides it's best to fight Clover, even though she is vastly weaker than he is, while they are transporting a dangerous criminal. And then they crash several miles outside of Atlas for no real reason. At which point, Clover is still attempting to arrest Crow. Even when Tyrion escapes, Clover still views Crow as the bigger threat, the one that must be handled before Tyrion can even be thought about. And Crow's response to this is to team up with Tyrion, the psychopath who has actively attempted to kill him multiple times, and is then surprised when Tyrion murders Clover. Oh, and then there's also the fact that Clover, who just literally said that he trusts Ironwood with his life, wishes Crow good luck and getting revenge on Ironwood for Clover's death. It's all just utterly ridiculous and stupid and insane and just so unnecessary. There are better ways of doing that. Better ways of seeing things through. I've actually heard people say that now Robin is their most hated character because she started the fight, but really they were all just absolute idiots. Oh, and... Let's not forget this. Crow is a bird. He, at any point during any stage of this cluster fudge, he could have simply turned into a bird and flown away. I honestly think that when Robin and Clover had started fighting, if Crow had just turned into a bird, opened the door, and flown away, they would have been so utterly shocked that they wouldn't have even tried to stop him. They would have just kind of stared out there and looked back and forth, each questioning their own sanity for a good five minutes. Because it's been well established that turning into a bird is not a normal semblance, not something that would be realistically possible in this world. All right, next up, let's talk about Winter and Crow. Now, this is in no way a criticism of Crow and Clover together as friends, as a couple, or however you want to interpret it yourself. I personally don't care. I enjoy their back and forth, so I like them together. But these two definitely have a history together. That's been made very clear. The first time they saw each other in Volume 2, they got into one of the most epic and amazing fights we'd gotten in all of Ruby by that point. I mean, heck, even Ruby Chibi shipped them together. That does it! You're dead meat! <laughs> you know, flirting is a lot less destructive in my day. And yet, we get one single conversation between them. One little back and forth at the beginning of this volume. But I cannot believe that you allowed this to happen, Crow. You try stopping these kids when they have their minds set on something. Why? I'm not saying Crow should have swept her off her feet and they should have gone on epic dates and that should have been the entire volume. No, I'm not saying that whatsoever. I'm saying there should have been more interaction between these two. Especially because Crow has quit drinking. You know, that's kind of Winter's trigger because of her mother being a drunk and all. I have to imagine that she would have something to say about Crow quitting drinking. Seriously. Let's think about this. Weiss said that her mother started drinking heavily around her 10th birthday. Winter's exact age is known, but she already graduated when Weiss was in her first year of Beacon. So she's at least four, maybe five years older than Weiss. So putting her at about 15 when her mother started drinking heavily. She basically had her entire childhood with his mother, an amazing, kind, loving mother. A good mother, and then she was just forced to watch her slowly fall and fade in alcoholism. I mean, I have to imagine that's had some kind of very deep effect on her mental state. So every time she saw Crow drinking, it reminded her of the wonderful person that she lost in her life. And I have to imagine she would have some sort of reaction to Crow announcing that he was no longer drinking. And this wouldn't have to be like a full episode thing, just her saying something along the lines of, Crow, are you drunk again? And Crow saying... Not that it's any of your business, Ice Queen, but I quit drinking. And then she's kind of just, like, shocked and, like, oh, okay, and then walks away. And you see her kind of, like, staring off in the distance. I mean, the whole thing could have taken off 30 seconds, and it just would have been such an amazing moment for her character. I would have loved that. But nope, there was not a single line between them about Crow's drinking. 
Now, yes, Crow and Winter are still in Atlas, and there's a very good chance they're going to see each other again next volume. But the team has been in Atlas for at least a month. I'm saying at least two or three. At a certain point, Winter should have realized, wait a minute. I haven't seen Crow passed out in his own vomit in a while. What's going on here? Or at least some other sign that would tell her that he had quit drinking. But nope, we didn't see that. And it just really feels like a lost opportunity between these two characters. And I hope we see some of them next volume. I'm hoping at the very least we see Winter visiting Crow in his prison cell. And maybe they have a back and forth about Ironwood and everything going on. But we'll see about that. Anyway, moving on from the Ice Queen to the Ice Prince. Let's talk about Whitley. Now, there's been a very sharp war in the Ruby community for quite a while between those who think that Whitley is a cold-blooded sociopath who's going to end up working for Salem and murder his entire family so he can take the company for himself, and the side that thinks that Whitley is just a poor, innocent kid who has done nothing wrong. Now, I will certainly admit that at the start of this volume, I was in the former category. I definitely believe that Whitley was evil, and this volume was finally going to give us some real proof of that, but... Not anymore. I still think there's a good chance he might turn to the dark side, but I'll get into that in a second. I mean, let's do the same math we did with uh, Winter here. Let's say Whitley is uh, four or five years younger than Weiss. So on Weiss's 10th birthday, when her mother started running away from reality, Whitley was arguably five. That means for the majority of his life, he's grown up without a mother and with an ass for a father. He has grown up without any warmth or love whatsoever. And that really does explain his cold nature and personality. And I still think there's hope for him to... You know, come back, become one of the good guys, join Team Ruby in a certain sense. I can certainly see him taking over the uh, Schnee Dust Company by the end of the series and turning into more of an ethical business. But the thing that irked me about this volume, the thing that I truly, truly hated, was you, Weiss. Now, your mother gave you everything you needed to take down your father. She not only had all the security footage of his office, but she even queued it up to the exact right minute you needed to show the council to get your father arrested. And after all that help she gave you in taking down your father, she asked one thing of you. One simple thing. Remember what that was, Weiss? Yeah, don't forget Whitley. Don't forget the brother you've abandoned twice over now. And what did you do? You forgot about Whitley! You abandoned your brother once more to watch all by himself as his father, the only parent this boy has ever really known, dragged out in handcuffs. Yeah, Weiss, if Whitley becomes a villain next volume, it is on you and you alone. You, I know you were in a rush to go save Mantle. You couldn't have spared 10, 15 seconds to go give your brother a hug, tell him it's going to be okay, I'm coming back for you. You're not, I'm not going to abandon you again. Just that little thing, that little thing would have made all the difference. Yes, Whitley would have probably pushed you away. Yes, Whitley probably would have said, I don't need this. I'd leave me alone or something like that. But it would have been something, some small act of kindness that he has seen so little of in his short life. I mean, seriously, Ruby and Oscar had a full minute to flirt. You couldn't have found 20 seconds, 30 seconds just to go tell your brother he's going to be okay. Give him a hug, just something. That really irked me, and I am convinced that it's going to come back to bite Weiss in the butt next volume when... I don't know, Whitley sides with Salem or betrays them somehow, some way. But we'll see about that. And finally, we reach number one. Uh, please, uh, leave a comment down below. Let me think your guess is. I'll give you 10 seconds. Do, 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 do. All right, number one, Penny's Return. Now, let me just say right off the bat, I freaking love Penny this volume. I thought she was cute. I thought she was adorable. I loved the back and forth she had with Ruby. And Penny gave us something as volume we have not seen in quite a while. Friendship. I mean, seriously, when was the last time Ruby gave us friendship between characters that wasn't actually just flirting in disguise? Seriously. But my problem lies in Penny's return. More specifically, the moment after Ruby realizes Penny's there, and Penny sees her, she gets all smiling, like, oh, it's such a cute moment. And then Penny takes a stance to give Ruby a rocket hug. Yeah. Now, I'm not going to lie. I laughed when I saw this. I thought that was really funny. But it just took something away from what could have been one of the best moments in all of Ruby. I mean, this show's reunions have been some of my favorite parts in all of it. Let's, I mean, let's look at Yang and Weiss's reunion. These two haven't really had that much of interaction or that much of a friendship. We've seen at least for the first three volumes. And yet when Weiss jumped on her, gave her a hug and told her how much he missed her, I cried. I cried. I have no problem admitting that. 
And then when Yang and Ruby reunited, I cried again. And then they opened up to invite Weiss to the group hug. And I cried again. And I'm crying right now. That scene literally had me bawling my eyes out. And they could have done that again, this one. I mean, there was definitely room for tears. A theory I had, and quite a few members of the Ruby community had as well, was that we were going to see Penny again this volume, but she would have no memories of Ruby, and she would be a cold, lifeless robot. I mean, I was ready to cry already. If Penny said something along the lines of, Salutations! It's nice to meet you! I mean, that would have just broken me. But, I mean, even, even without the whole amnesia thing, if these two had just had a real moment together... I mean, as far as, you know, Ruby, Yang, Weiss, their whole reunions together go, they all knew the other was still alive, still kicking, still fine, as best they could tell, and there was no reason to think otherwise. Ruby watched Penny cut to pieces and die in front of her. Yeah, you remember that? Remember Ruby crying over Penny's death? And yet this moment didn't really feel like it did justice to that. I wanted to see tears. I wanted to see Ruby break down a little to hug Penny and just start crying or just have something yet but instead the whole thing was just played as a joke and it really wasn't as impactful as it could have been. Kruby had the chance to make this my favorite scene in Ruby of all time. And some tears, some hugging, just a lot of emotions and instead we got a supersonic hug which funny yes but just not the same. So yeah those were the six things I hated in Ruby volume 7 but overall even with these issues I still absolutely love the volume. And I have a video planned for sometime next week. Seven things I love about Ruby Volume 7. That number will probably change. So be sure to like and subscribe so you don't miss that video. And let me know down below. Uh, what do you think of these six things? Did you hate them? Did you like them? And please, if you liked any of them, let me know down below. I'm very curious. I love seeing things from different perspectives, from different point of views. So if you have some justification for liking Ren this volume or anything else I said, just let me know down below. I'd love to hear about it. But yeah, said, like, subscribe, leave a comment, and until next time, peace.